know, here physically, or maybe you're just watching this online, I'm thankful that you joined us for this series. Um, we are on week three of a five-week series based on some of the core principles and teachings from the book of Romans. And Romans, which was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, obviously, is a, a concise, logical, and well-ordered a presentation of Christian theology. Uh, in it, Paul carefully and systematically lays out the foundations of the Christian faith, including sin and salvation, sanctification, God's sovereignty, and, and a life of service. In the first few chapters, Paul addresses the problem of sin. Uh, he describes how people willfully ignore God and, and we worship idols instead of of God Himself, and, and we indulge in all sorts of immorality. And all of humankind, he says, is guilty of sin. No one is righteous, not even one. That's the bad news. The worst news is that, as he says, the wages or the penalty for sin is death. A point that Paul reiterates over and over throughout the book of Romans. But, after delivering the bad news, Paul then goes on to explain in chapter 3 the good news, the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus. Uh, as we saw last Sunday, chapters 3 through 5, Paul explains that Jesus rescued us from certain death when he sacrificed himself for our sins on the cross. And our response to that, what God requires from us in response to the sacrifice of Jesus, is faith. He wants us to trust in Jesus, to put our faith in him. And when we do that, it results in forgiveness and peace and joy and friendship with God and eternal life among many other blessings. And so having tackled the topics of sin and salvation, Paul then moves on to the next major issue of Christian theology, which is sanctification. And sanctification refers to the act or the process of making something or someone holy. Uh, for the Christian, it refers to the process of becoming more and more like Jesus, you know, more like God in the way that we live and act and, and feel. And this process of spiritual growth and development is important because many new Christians often wonder, okay, well, so I believe in Jesus, I, I accepted Him as my Savior, He's forgiven me of my sins, now what? You know, what do you do next? What do you do once you become a Christian? And Paul spends the next three chapters dealing with three possible answers to that question. Um, if you have a Bible or an app on your phone and you want to open it up, please uh, follow along with me. We're going to be in chapters 6 through 8 of the book of Romans. Romans 6 through 8. As I try to unpack these chapters a bit and discover the right, the biblical approach to spiritual growth and sanctification. Now, Surprisingly, one possible response, and the first one that Paul deals with, to being saved by grace through faith, is to continue living in sin. Living in sin. This is the first response that Paul anticipates from his readers. And so he writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Now, any mature Christian is going to read this question and they're going to think it's just absolutely absurd and silly. You know, it's, it, that's obviously a dumb question, right? They say there's no such thing as a dumb question. That's a dumb question, isn't it? But it actually makes a lot of sense if you put yourselves in their shoes. It, it's a, a somewhat logical and natural question to ask, especially for like a new believer. And, and I want you to track the thought process here with me. Earlier in the previous chapter, chapter 5, uh, verse 20, Paul said, as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace abounds more and more. In other words, you can't out -sin the grace of God, right? No matter how much you sin, there will always be more than enough grace to cover your sins, to wash your sins away, etc. And Paul knew that some people would interpret that to mean, well, if... If God loves to forgive sin, well, shouldn't we give Him more sins to forgive? 
Or, you know, if God is glorified by showing us grace, well, then we need to do more things so that He gives more grace so that He's more glorified. Like, I, there, there's a weird logic to the question, and that's why Paul feels like he has to address it. But based on that logic, a person could put their faith in Jesus and become a Christian and then just continue to lie or cheat or steal or sleep around or whatever, you know, you name it. Any and every sin that they might want to commit, they could just continue doing those things and never experience a changed life. Unfortunately, that rationale is no less common today than it was in Paul's day. Now, I, I don't think most people today actually think it through the way that they seem to have in Rome, but their actions reveal the same mindset. Now, there are folks who, who just know that God is gracious and God is good and He forgives all of our sins, so they don't feel any real motivation to change, to, to stop their sinful behavior. They can party on Saturday and still go to church on Sunday. They can use God's grace as an excuse to continue living in sin. Some people have the mentality of this, this little boy that I heard about um, in Sunday school class. His teacher had just wrapped up their lesson and she was you know, asking a follow-up question to make sure everybody understood the point. And so she asks the class, she says, uh, so can anybody tell me what you have to do in order to receive forgiveness for your sins? And after a short pause, one little boy in the back threw his hand up in the air and he said, you got to sin, right? And he's not wrong. I mean, you do have to sin before you can be forgiven for your sins. And that's kind of the approach that some people just take. If, if I want to be forgiven, I got to sin first. So let's just get that part out of the way. But notice Paul's emphatic response to this question of whether or not we should continue sinning. He says in verse 2 and following, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Now the phrase translated, of course not, at the very beginning of this verse, is a powerful, emphatic negative. It, it's translated a variety of different ways depending on the, the version of the Bible that you're reading from. The New, New American Standard says, may it never be. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard says, absolutely not. Uh, the, the Old King James says, God forbid. Um, the, the God's Word translation says, that's unthinkable. You know, needless to say, that's a hard no from the Apostle Paul. And he then explains that we can't keep living in sin because we died to sin when we became Christians. And he uses baptism, something that every Christian ought to be able to relate to because we've all been through that process, as uh, an illustration to explain his point. The act of water baptism carries a lot of significance and symbolism. The, the waters of baptism echo the death of burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The, the plunge beneath the running water is like a death. The, the moment's pause as the waters sweep overhead is like a burial. And then rising up into the air and sunlight once again is a symbol of resurrection. Just as Jesus literally, physically died and rose again, believers metaphorically die to our old sinful way of life when we're buried with Christ in baptism, and when we rise up out of the water, we're supposed to, to rise up to a whole new way of living. And Paul adds, he says in verses 5-11, through 11, since we have been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Suffice it to say, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could continue to live in sin and immorality. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, we need to consider ourselves, as Paul says, dead to sin and start living godly lives to the glory of God. 
The question remains, though, how do we do that? Well, what should our, our new lives look like? Well, another approach to sanctification that Paul anticipates is living in statutes. Statutes, not statues. I was afraid I was going to say statues every time I use that word. But, but in other words, we're talking about living according to the law. In the early days of Christianity, many believers uh, who had converted from Judaism wanted to return to the old ways after accepting Christ. Now, they believed in Jesus, and they, they knew that they needed Jesus in order to be saved, but they, they just wanted to keep the law of Moses too. They thought that was still an important part of their relationship with God. They, uh, and, and these Jewish converts became known as Judaizers, a term that's just evolved from a Greek term that means to, to live according to Jewish customs. And these Judaizers taught that in order uh, for a Christian to be truly right with God, he or she must conform to the law of Moses in addition to having faith in Jesus. Circumcision was uh, even considered necessary for salvation. And Gentiles were expected to con become Jewish proselytes first, and then they can convert to Christianity. So it was like a two-step conversion for them. And, and the doctrine of the Judaizers was a mixture of grace through faith in Jesus and works through keeping the law of Moses. And believe it or not, this legalistic mindset is still alive and well in the church today. Now, most Christians are not committed to abstaining from shellfish or pork or you know, keeping all of the old Jewish holidays from the Old Testament. But many believers see their relationship with God as this itemized checklist of do's and don'ts. You know, they, they try to earn God's approval by obeying a, a certain set of rules. You know, maybe it's keeping the Ten Commandments or, or attending church or some other you know, good deeds that they feel like they have to check off the list. You know, they, they think, if I just attend this class, or if I give this money, if I read my Bible, if I have all the right opinions about all the right doctrines, if I join this ministry, if I endure another one of Scott's sermons, then God will approve of me. He'll accept me. And, and the rules might be different, but the mentality is still the same. They're still trying to live by statutes and ordinances instead of by God's grace. But Paul responds to those still living in statutes the same way that he responds to those still living in sin. He writes in verses 1-4 through four of chapter 7, Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. So again, Paul makes the, the same application. He, he says that just as we died to sin, we also died to legalism. In short, we're no longer slavishly bound by the law of Moses or any other list of rules and regulations. What's more, trying to live by the law only leads to sin and death. Listen as, as Paul explains this. This is a little bit longer of a passage, but he says uh, in the rest of chapter 7, well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? No, of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. Are you following Paul's argument throughout this, this passage? He explains that all of God's commands, all 613 of them contained in the Old Testament, uh, 
are good and holy and right. You know, God always commands good things. But the problem is I'm not good and holy and right. And so if we measure our spiritual growth by how well we keep God's commands, we'll always fall short because once again, we're relying on our own ability instead of God's grace and power. The law was never meant to be our savior. Rather, it was meant to show us that we need a savior. When we try to live as legalistic statute keepers, one of the of two things tends to happen. Either we become blind to our own shortcomings. You know, we think more of ourselves than we should and we look down on everybody else from our high horse. Or we become all too aware of our shortcomings and sins and, and live in a constant state of guilt and inadequacy because we, we feel like we don't measure up because we, we don't. And, and so both of these kind of polarizing perspectives are counterproductive when it comes to true spiritual growth. Which is why Paul concludes in uh, verse 6, now we can serve God not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. And that brings us to the last and best way to become more Christ-like, which is, of course, living in the Spirit. When we reach chapter 8, Paul elaborates on this notion. Uh, he explains, starting in verse 1, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. Even if you can't keep the law, that's his point here. If, even if you fall short and you sin a whole, whole bunch, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Another marvelous benefit of, of putting our faith in Jesus is the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit takes up residence in our hearts and minds when we become Christians. And throughout this chapter, Paul explains that the only way to truly overcome the sins that we continually struggle with is to live in harmony with the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Well, it's a mindset. Listen to, to what Paul says in the following verses. Do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, about the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. Now, when a person is determined to do something or, or holds a certain set of beliefs and ideas, we say that that person has a certain mindset and a person's mindset will determine you know, how that person acts. It will determine you know, what, what influences they choose to listen to and learn from. Uh, it shapes the person's value system, motivates the person, and really affects that person's view of, of every experience. And Paul here uh, sort of breaks down all the various mindsets a person can have into two broad categories. Sinful and spiritual. Now the word translated flesh in this passage isn't talking about our, our skin and bones. It's talking about our sinful human nature. And, and so we can either have this sinful mindset or a spiritual mindset, either, either human or holy. And by having the mindset of the Holy Spirit, we begin to live Spirit-led lives. In other words, if you change the way you think, you change the way you live. And Paul later explains that a little bit more clearly in chapter 12, verse 2. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, God wants to completely transform us from the inside out. He wants to make us 
into the image of His Son, Jesus. That's His whole plan for us, is to become just like Jesus. And this spiritual transformation begins in the mind, where all thoughts and actions start. When we actively choose a spiritual mindset to set our minds on the things of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, etc., etc., then the Holy Spirit will begin to shape the way that we think and the way that we view the world. I believe that the, the Spirit's primary tool in accomplishing this, by the way, is the Bible. As we memorize and meditate on God's Word, it changes our way of thinking and seeing the world. Our, our minds first become informed by God's Spirit and then gradually become transformed by God's Spirit. The Spirit of God, in other words, uses the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. According to Romans, this is how sanctification, real spiritual transformation, takes place. Again, change your thoughts and you change your life. So what do we do after coming to Christ and receiving salvation by grace through faith? Well, we've got some options. We could continue living in sin, uh, using God's grace as an excuse to do whatever we want to do. But, as Paul says, that's unthinkable. We could try legalistically living by the statutes and ordinances given in the law, but that really only leads to more struggle and more sin and more death. Or, we could start living by the Spirit and allow God to transform our lives by changing the way that we think. The right choice seems pretty obvious to me. I hope that you'll join me again next week when we dig a little deeper into the book of Romans as Paul explains the Christian concept of God's sovereignty. In the meantime, maybe you're, you're struggling with sin personally. Maybe you're still living in sin and you need to repent of that. Or maybe you've been living with guilt and shame because you're constantly trying to measure up to this, this standard that you're never going to measure up to. I want to encourage you to, to change your mindset. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit and let God go to work in your life. And if I can help with that, please you know, reach out to me. You can pull me aside after church. You can call me at home or just come forward now while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.